Ed. Welcome to Space Chat. This is the weekly show where I go live for space.com and I let you know everything that's been going on in space and science. Uh, now, because this is completely live, I'm going to give everyone a minute or so to get situated and get logged on so that they don't miss any of so that they don't miss any of the fun. And while I can double check that we are in fact live and you can in fact hear me. Um, so welcome to everyone who is new or who perhaps has been here before. Uh, uh, <laughs> apologies for the brief uh, lapse, just making sure everything is running smoothly. Again, when things are live, you never know what could happen with technology. You just never know. Uh, who knows? This could be on Meta Live soon. I don't know if you've heard. Facebook is becoming Meta. They're going through a whole rebrand. Um, but it seems that we are all good. And so without further ado, let's jump into it. For those of you just joining, I'm Chelsea, and this is Space Chat, the space.com live show where every week I come on here and I let you know what's new in space and science. This week, that includes SpaceX's ever-delaying astronaut launch, new research in climate change, and an extremely powerful solar storm. Uh, so really, really a lot going on. Very, very exciting. Uh, now, as I say quite often, space is a busy place, and this week is no exception. So let's start with this solar storm that tore through the solar system this week. Now, solar storms, also known as coronal mass ejections, happen when plasma and magnetic fields from the sun's corona, or upper atmosphere, are released out in a hot, energetic burst. The charged particles from these events make their way outwards from the sun. And sometimes, they make their way all the way to Earth. Now, there's something called the solar wind, which is a stream of these charged particles that is kind of routinely released from the sun's upper atmosphere, and it makes its way to Earth. When these particles interact with Earth's atmosphere, it can create auroras, uh, things like the northern lights, if you're familiar with that. Uh, and this is something that happens, you know, it's not some kind of crazy storm, but it happens relatively routinely. However, when storms like happened this week uh, happen, uh, <laughs> coronal mass ejections, uh, it can make auroras and northern lights a lot more powerful and it can make them spread a lot further than they often would. Um, in fact, this week's solar storm was dubbed a cannibal coronal mass ejection uh, because it was so powerful that it overtook a previous solar storm. Uh, now, this, this storm was so powerful that the northern lights were predicted to stretch as far south as Pennsylvania, with sky watchers possibly getting a view from Pennsylvania all the way to Iowa and Oregon in the United States, places that typically do not see the northern lights at all. Now, the storm's power also uh, was warned to interfere with power grids, satellites, even radio signals. Uh, if you saw an aurora over this past week or experienced any strange technological effects from the solar storm, uh, I would love to know. I'm very curious. So let me know in the comments below if you experienced anything, saw anything, um, or if you've ever seen the Northern Lights, if you've ever seen an aurora. I've personally never witnessed one in person, um, and I'm sure that it's really something special. Now, also this week, new climate science took center stage at the United Nations Climate Change Conference that kicked off in Glasgow in Scotland. The two-week conference gathered countries together to discuss ways to take a more aggressive approach to combating climate change, from cutting down greenhouse gas emissions to mitigating what's already been done. Now, at this conference in 2015, which was held in Paris, participating countries signed what's now known as the Paris Agreement, basically agreeing to work to keep global temperatures ideally below 1.5 degrees over pre-industrial levels, uh, basically committing themselves to taking a really uh, forward, aggressive stance against climate change. Uh, so this, this is an, an annual conference that takes place where they gather again and discuss what they can do to keep sticking to these goals. Now, amidst all the new studies coming out from this conference, um, showing how Earth's ice sheets are melting, sea levels are rising, et cetera, new satellite data actually emerged from PLANET, formerly known as PLANET Labs. And this satellite data and imagery 
is actually being used by researchers studying walruses from space. Yes, uh, researchers are using this satellite data to study walrus populations off the coast of Alaska. It previously, walruses have congregated by the thousands on sheets of sea ice, but as the sea ice melts, they're forced to congregate on land, uh, which isn't great because human interference has a pretty devastating impact on their populations. Um, however, researchers are studying this shift and studying these populations quite literally from space, groups of thousands of walruses visible by satellites. Pretty unbelievable. Now, Shifting gears a little bit uh, to human spaceflight, NASA's Crew-3 mission, its next mission to carry astronauts to the space station, has been delayed once again. Uh, first, there were weather issues, and then a medical issue delayed the launch, and it was again delayed from its next launch date this Saturday with more bad weather conditions. Um, the launch is now a possibly taking place basically no sooner than Monday, November 8th, but there is no set launch date for Crew 3's launch. Um, however, there's a bit of a snag with this whole launch debacle because it's not just the Crew 3 astronauts that have to get to space, the Crew 2 astronauts on the space station, they have to get home. Uh, the Crew Dragon that Crew 2 took to space it's only rated for about 210 days in space or about seven months. And the crew is just a few days away from passing that threshold for how long this spacecraft is supposed to be in operation in space. So they've got to get home. So right now, NASA put out a statement yesterday saying they're trying to figure it out. Um, they're trying to see if possibly they could bring the crew to astronauts home before Crew-3 even launches. Uh, now, this would be pretty different from how they've done things previously uh, because their original plan, as they've done before, was to send the new astronauts up to meet the old astronauts. They'd kind of change things over, spend a few days going over what's been going on on the space station, turning it over to the new astronauts, and then coming home. So this would be a pretty big shift. Now, something else that happened this week in the world of human spaceflight Blue Origin uh, lost its uh, lost its lawsuit, uh, its federal lawsuit against NASA uh, for their decision to award SpaceX and only SpaceX the human landing systems contract in April. Uh, NASA basically made their decision on what company would build their new moon lander. And everyone thought, well, they'll probably pick two of the three possible companies that are in the running just so they can have a backup, just in case, right? But what NASA did was they only chose SpaceX um, for reasons that they stated about the technology itself and financial reasons and a whole host of other reasons. Uh, now, Blue Origin was one of the companies that lost out on this contract. Um, they filed protests with the GAO and they ended up filing a federal lawsuit against NASA for their decision to just award SpaceX this contract. Uh, and because of all of this legal action from Blue Origin, um, they actually had to put the entire project on hold. They had to basically hit a big pause button on building the moon lander. Um, oops, sorry if you hear that in the background, that's my doorbell. Uh, and, so, <laughs> and so it really kind of made things a bit difficult. So for months, SpaceX hasn't been able to even work on their moon lander because of all of this legal action. But this past week, uh, it was found that Blue Origin's lawsuit, it's not going to continue. Um, they basically lost uh, and they are not going to get their way with this one. Um, so I'm curious what you all think of that. It's kind of a, a strange situation. Um, there's been government involvement, legal involvement, et cetera. <laughs> Oop. Sorry, sorry, one moment. Sorry, the, the doorbell is a little bit loud and a little bit close to me. Um, but I'm curious in the comments below if you could sound off and let me know what you think of this whole Blue Origin Moonlander debacle. Now, moving on to the night sky. Tonight actually marks the beginning of the annual Torrid Meteor Shower's peak. The meteor shower peaks tonight through November 12th. Uh, it's an annual meteor shower that's caused by Earth passing through the debris from the comet Ankh. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, uh, during Earth's orbit around the sun. So if you go outside at night this week and see what looks like a yellowish 
orangish or even reddish shooting star, it's very possible that what you're actually seeing is a torrid meteor. And if you get any really cool photos, if we have any really cool meteor watching stories, um, we at space.com, we'd always love to hear it. We'd love to see it. Uh, we'd love to share in your sky watching excitement. So that's been all that's been new in space this week. I know it's a lot as per usual. So now we get to my favorite part of space chat where we chat and I answer your burning space questions. So if you've not gotten the chance to ask a question yet, now's the time. So pop your questions down into the comments below and I will get through as many as I possibly can. So I'm going to turn over here and start checking them out. All right. Let's see. <laughs> All right, Mahmood on YouTube asks, if the sun has so many explosions on its surface, why doesn't it explode into pieces? Um, so it's not really explosions like we think of them on Earth, right? It's not like there's buildings on the surface of the sun being a rocky planet and that they are being destroyed and, and being exploded by some outside force. Um, this is basically the, the internal combustion of the sun kind of bubbling up to the surface and bubbling out and some of that material, some of those particles bubbling out and then being released into the rest of the solar system. So it's not an explosion like we think of destructive uh, you know, external forces, explosions here on Earth. Um, it's more so just a product of the sun's internal mechanisms um, and just how it works. Uh, it's not, you know, being destroyed by these explosions. And they're very small uh, in comparison when you consider how big and fiery and energetic the sun as a whole actually is. Uh, interesting question. Let's see. Gentile on YouTube, why do rockets turn horizontal a few minutes after launch? I'm not 100% sure what you mean by that. Um, it's possible that if you've seen a rocket launch um, by a company like SpaceX that uses reusable rockets, what happens is the booster will at some point after they launch um, detach from whatever spacecraft they're trying to put into space. And that craft will continue onward with all that propulsion from the rocket. And then the booster will kind of fall back to Earth. Um, you know, it, it might look different ways for different launches, different rockets, and that booster will fall back and actually land itself back on Earth. So it's possible that that might be what you've seen before. Um, and that's a part of the growing, uh, you know, kind of re reusable rocket technology, which is really cool. Um, and hopefully will make space a little bit more sustainable and make it easier to launch more uh, over time. All right, Andrew, how can brain damage be avoided? Um, brain damage caused by long, a long time spent in space. Um, so there are a lot of physical repercussions of even short term, uh, short duration space travel, but we don't fully understand all of the possible side effects yet. We know that the radiation that comes along with being in space at all, let alone for a long period of time, um, can lead to a lot of issues um, like higher risks of cancer. Um, there have been extensive studies on the effects of even just astronauts on the space station coming home after a few months. Um, so we're still working to understand exactly how space affects the human body. Um, but as we're learning more about that, researchers are also coming up with ways to combat that, whether it's different things astronauts could wear, different materials that spacecraft could be made out of that could be more protective, um, trying to get ahead of it as we look into the future when we will be in space for longer periods of time. All right, Yashuka and beyond, I believe you're on YouTube. Uh, why do people like to study Mars, why not Europa or even dwarf planets? Uh, people have always been fascinated by Mars, um, but there are there's a lot of research about you know, Europa, there's the Dragonfly mission um, going to Titan. There's all kinds of amazing research on all, all kinds of different space objects, um, planets, moons, etc. cetera. Uh, but I think humankind has always been fascinated by Mars for all kinds of reasons. One of which is that we can see it in the night sky. In fact, even when it's hard to see other things in the night sky, for many, Mars is something that's easy to spot. No binoculars, no telescope required. It has a distinctive reddish hue. It's it, it's easy to see. And so I think that part of the reason why humans have always been so intrigued by it is that we can actually see it. Um, and But yeah, there's lots of other interesting uh, things in our solar system and beyond. All right, Raphael asking about DARPA exoskeletons. I'm not sure exactly 
which exoskeletons or DARPA technology you're referring to. Um, unfortunately, Karen, how does it affect our moon? I'm not sure what you mean. How does the solar storm affect our moon? The solar storm would not affect our moon. Um, unless you mean something else, uh, but none of the things I mentioned will have an effect on our moon, rest assured. All right, Nirvana, how's temperature maintained on the space station? Great question. Um, in fact, there's a lot of environmental control that goes into the space station. Um, there's water recycling, there's, you know, air temperature control. There's a lot of, you know, like how we control the temperature and how we have environmental controls in a building here on Earth, it's like that, just a little bit more extreme. And they have to be very careful about how much uh, carbon dioxide, for example, is in the air because, you know, they're, they don't, they can't open a window on the space station and, and let some fresh air in. So they have to make sure that the air is processed correctly and that they have what they need in the air to breathe properly. Um, and temperature is just the same. What is the galaxy? Not sure what you mean by that. Chen Tao, can we use robots to do research on the ISS? Yes, robots are a huge uh, part of space station research. There have been some weird robots that have launched up there. Uh, Skybot, uh, the Astro Bees, all kinds of fun robot experiments. Um, Piet, I heard that we're going to explore Venus again. Is that true? Yes, there were two new missions this past year approved, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, um, that will be studying Venus. So there's going to be a lot of amazing new Venus science that comes out um, in the future. And I can't wait to see those missions continue to develop. So with that, I'm going to leave you all. Thank you so much. This has been Space Chat. Join me again next Friday. And as always, if you have a question, if we didn't get a chance to answer it, uh, if you have a lingering question, comment, cool photo you took of a meteor shower, feel free to send it to us over social media or email it away. Thank